and thank you to everyone who have joined us today um, for this Sydney ID Distinguished Lecture. Uh, we are delighted to introduce Professor Linfa Wang. Um, Linfa heads the program you know, in Emerging Infectious Diseases at Duke NUS in Singapore, and is best known and world renowned for his work on bat-borne viruses and virus host interactions. He serves on multiple international committees dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and received the Singapore President's Science Award in 2021 for his work on SARS-related virus research. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Linfa and um, just to remind everyone that please use the Q&A button and the social media um, platforms that, that Jocelyn referred to. Over to you, Linfa. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Ben. I just make sure that the, the slides mode is already in display, right? It's all okay. Yes, you can yes, see we my can slide. See. Great, great. See. Thank you. No, no, thanks. And the first apology, as you know, I tried to make it in person, but it uh, uh, didn't work last month. So next time, hopefully, you know, uh, I will visit and especially, you know, catch up with Eddie. You know, we have seen each other on Zooms too often, obviously. Yeah, so the topic is very general because I don't know the audience. You know, I try to keep it general so that really the you know the two aspects one is bats as a reservoir of viral disease but the other i think is relatively new is really as the keystone species to go beyond just you know infectious diseases so this is the outline you know yeah start with the bat, uh, viruses then go to bats and then come back to viruses so the bat bone viruses as ben, ben says you know i basically i was trained as a biochemist but my whole career basically you know I went to uh, the Australian Animal Health Laboratory in Geelong, 1990, and the Hangzhou virus, 1994. So ever since I have been working on bat bone viruses. So why bats are such a good reservoir of viruses? So I will just touch this uh, uh, briefly and I introduce is a major review that you guys can follow. And then really that, you know, the, the keystone species status of bats, you know, beyond infectious disease research. And, you know, so before COVID-19, my lab was 80% already on bat immunology. So infectious disease is a minor part. Of course, that changed due to COVID. So then I come back to viruses and I'm going to raise this kind of, you know, uh, not controversial, but uh, I know, you know, we're still in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, but uh, for people like me having been working in this field for a long, long time, I asked this question, say, you know, after SARS-1, SARS-2, can we do better? Are we ready for SARS-3? So this is the flow of the talk today. You know, so some of you may have seen these slides. I like to think of, you know, viruses and the terrorists, you know, and the Donald Rumsfeld, the famous quote in 2002, right? You know, to characterize the terrorist attack in three categories, the, the known knowns, the people have already committed and you monitor them. And the people you guess they would do things similar, the known unknowns, and then there's a group outside there that totally unknown unknowns. So in emerging infectious diseases, you know, that's what we're dealing with, right? You know, so the avian flu, for example, we know that that's a class we have been monitoring for a long, long time. But then we have the known unknowns, you know, after SARS-1, we knew that backbone coronavirus will emerge, but we don't really have our fingers on which one, you know. And then, you know, when like the SARS-1 uh, emerged initially or hangovirus in Australia, it's totally unknown, unknown, because we never knew Paramyxovirus and the coronaviruses can be that lethal and that transmissible. Yeah. So as I said, you know, I was trained as a biochemist and uh, accidentally I went to Australia and I got a job in the Australian Animal Health Laboratory. So that was 1990. And then we play a role in discover of the hangovirus. And then 94. So by 2019, when COVID-19 emerged, I have been in this kind of field for 25 years, exactly in a quarter of century. So look at this, right? You know, Hanjo, as I said, was uh, unknown, unknown, but Nipper, we learned the lesson from Hanjo. We used the reagent, you know, to really speed up the, the etiological research. So Nipper become a uh, known unknown. And then the SARS, you know, the SARS-CoV-1, when it emerged is again, it's unknown, unknown because the coronavirus has never been sort of associated with this kind of a disease and the uh, uh, larger scale pandemics. And then follow that by that we have MERS and the COVID-19, you know, so, so COVID-19, I classify this as a known unknown, you know. So this is the type of the virus and, the, you know, uh, almost every few years now, five to seven years on average, we have a major disease outbreak 
and of course I'm biased. I only list the ones that are original from bats and then you have Zika virus and other, you know, uh, Arbo virus as well. So, you know, uh, uh, on a temporal scale time, you know, the last quarter of century, we had a six major ones, fat bone zoonotic disease outbreak. Then especially, you know, you look at the, the location, I always say, you know, as clean as in Australia, you know, Brisbane, we had the hendrovirus outbreak. So basically, you know, this kind of spillover can happen anytime and the intermediate host can go from a horse to, you know, pigs to uh, uh, camels to pangolins to, to civets maybe. So that was followed by the Nipah outbreak in Malaysia, Singapore, and then went to SARS-1, we believe is in Southern China, Shenzhen area. And then we had this MERS in Middle East and the, the Ebola in West Africa, and then 2019 back in Wuhan, you know, in Asia. So again, you know, uh, uh, the risk is not limited to certain geographic location. So, you know, as an Australian virologist, we were very, very proud because I think the whole area of backbone emerging zoonotic viruses really started. The modern era, right? hundred years ago, we already knew in South America, you know, bats are the reservoir of rabies or Lisa virus. But the modern, I always say, the modern backbone virus research started with the outbreak of the Hendra virus, and uh, very impressively, the team was able to point to bats as the reservoir, you know, within 16 months after discovery of the virus from uh, fatal cases of uh, human and horses. So, so this is kind of 1996, you know, we nailed down to say bats are the reservoir. So today, if you go to PubMed, you know, this is a uh, what you get, right? For bats and the viruses, as you can see from 1996, maybe, you know, less than 10 papers a year, go all the way to 2021, you know, we hit like a 600 something. So bats and the viruses, you know, certainly become a quite hot topic in, in the field of emerging infectious disease. So why bats, you know, why bats are such a good reservoir? And, uh, you know, so I will not spend too much time today to describe on this, but just to, you know, uh, for you to think about what's unique about bats, you know, we have, you know, uh, around 5,000, you know, uh, species of mammal on earth and the 20%, over 1,000 of them is a bats. But their unique is that they're the only flying mammal, right? So, you know, the other, mam other mammals that we consider terrestrial, you know? And uh, so they have to adapt to flight because you look at these three numbers, right? The facts, metabolic rate, you know, they can go all the way to 30 times of their resting rate within minutes of flying. Heartbeat, you know, can go to thousand beats per minute and their body temperature can go to, you know, all the way to 42 degrees. And if any of this, if it happen to a human, you know, you'll be very sick or you'll be dead, right? And but for bats, that's their normal physiology. And they do this a few hours every day, you know, every night when they get out, you know, for, for food or, you know, other social activities. So again, you know, I, this has been, you know, uh, 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 two decades of my research. And then finally, you know, in 2020, we were invited to put this perspective in nature, basically to summarize the lessons from the host defense of bats, really try to explain why bats are such a good reservoir. So I think that we really, you know, uh, 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 zoom down to this uh, 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 defense tolerance balance. Whether you are bats, human or mouse, right? Our immune system there to do the main thing is defend ourselves. But we all know that if you over defend, then you cause the immunopathology, over inflammation. And uh, so virologists have a cliche to say very few virus kills us. We kill ourselves, which include Ebola virus and the SARS-CoV-2. The inflammation part is really the pathogenic part. So you know, this is the, the, the summary of the, the, the paper basically to say, you know, we have found certain immune defense genes like the interferons, the interferon stimulator genes, the HISO proteins, the, the uh, you know, uh, membrane uh, effect pump ABCD1 family, P, uh, genes with autophagy. So these are the innate defense genes that uh, tend to have a high base level expression in bats. So bats are 
battle ready, if you think of that way, you know, whereas in human, we don't express these genes until we see the danger signal or get an infection. But equally important is on the right side is bats have evolved unique ways of dampening the overreaction of this defense, kind of immune defense. So the defense and the tolerance is balanced. So that really, you know, make them uh, idea a viral reservoir. So I don't have the time to show you data, but I have one slide to show that if you get a virus into human and the bats, you know, you can see that contrary to, you know, some perception in the field thinking that bats are very efficient in clear the virus and basically does not allow infection. That's not the case. Bats allow the infection, but they have a way to make sure that they go don't go overboard and don't develop disease. So, so when you get the balance right, and then the, the host and the pathogen basically go into a cool sort of existence. And some people even, you know, uh, suggest there a, a, a kind of a, a symbiotic relationship, which I personally think it's hard to prove that, but definitely that they can coexist peacefully for much better than other mammals. And that's explained, that's why they are such a good uh, viral reservoir. So then if we move on, you know, just look at the, so this is the reason we went to bat immunology, right? To look into what's the difference between fly mammal and a land mammal in the context of infection and being a viral reservoir. But the more we dig, you know, and of course then, you know, with our research and uh, other people from cancer, from heart, from neuro, you know, from diabetes or uh, autoimmune or start asking us questions, you know, have you seen this in bats and uh, is bat different? So we really don't have the bandwidth, you know, up until really very recently for two reasons. The one is the funding, the other is the tools are not there. So, so my lab, you know, uh, spent a lot of money and effort in the last maybe 10 years is to build up this two box from genomic cell line antibodies, you know, and we even built a bat mouse. Basically, you know, it's a immunodeficient uh, mouse with a bat immune system. So this is a short kind of a, a commentary viewpoint. Uh, you know, we published last year in the uh, Journal of Experiment Medicine, basically try to look at, you know, the unique bat features and how we can, you know, harvest, uh, you know, this kind of uh, knowledge and to expand the biomedical research beyond infectious disease. So, you know, there's many different versions of this kind of uh, uh, diagram, you know, so this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, Matei, my postdoc, really digging deep and uh, try to using published data to say, you know, mammals tend to follow certain rules, right? You know, if your body mass and your lifespan so small mammals like mice, you know, short lived and the uh, uh, humans, uh, you know, elephants, for example, you know, has a, a long lifespan. And so, and then you have a metabolic rate to lifespan, you have body mass to reproductive. And uh, so you go all through this and you look at that, bat is off the line. So body mass, bat's life, uh, longevity is much greater than mouse. Although most of the uh, uh, bats, the body weight is similar to to mouse, right? And the metabolic rate, bats is really high, the highest. And in terms of lifespan, you know, it's somewhere there. And then reproductive rate and uh, viral titer versus disease, viral titer versus inflammation. And the genetic closeness to humans, right? So they're very close to human. And then their zoonotic potential is greater than monkey, for example, you know? So they have all these unique features, you know? And we try to explain why they are such a good reservoir, but also this, you know, that's what a bank coid, the keystone species, you know, in really biology in general. Okay, so, so this is what we're doing, you know, uh, what we have established in the last 10 years. And uh, I have to say, you know, we burned maybe $20 million to do that. And so we established a breeding colony in the world. You know, there's maybe, you know, you can count with one hand in terms of number of a breeding colony, you know, established for research purpose. And we have established all sorts of different omics uh, analysis in the bioinformatics. And then, you know, magnetic studies, you know, using the, the different resources. And we have organoid, we have bat mouse, you know, we can do things like that. 
So this is kind of use this and you try to, you know, make discoveries and then you validate and, uh, you know, the concepts in engineer the mouse model. So we have uh, the world first transgenic mice, for example, we put in immune master regulators from bats and to see if the mouse have these now, can they resist infections, things like that. So we have a, a, a paper right now in rebuttal on that aspects. And then if you go even further and then, then you try to discover, you know, uh, and uh, really bat-based new kind of uh, 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 targets and the protein targets, peptides or small molecules for really therapeutics, right? You know, so you, from the tools you have from the basic studies and then from targeted identification and eventually in, in this day and age, if you apply for larger grant, they always ask you for some translational aspects. And initially, I thought it would take much longer. You know, so when I got the larger grant, you know, uh, nine years ago, I thought, you know, need at least 10, 20 years for us to get that. But, you know, we already have three patents like five, two years ago. So it is possible to learn from bats and benefit, you know, the, the human health. So as I said, I don't have the time really to go to detail of this bat immunology, but I just want to give you one kind of a, a taste of what we're doing, try to understand, you know, and then the, the focus area is inflammation, you know. So for those of you, you know, doctors in the audience, you know, I purposely to pro uh, produce a disease from A to Z, right? You know, agent to Z, Z Zika virus infection, and we could have put a COVID somewhere there, you know. I think you know it's very hard to really close your eyes and think of a disease you know where humans suffer from heart, from eye, from you know everything, cancer. You know that inflammation does not play a role. You know even our aging process, chronic inflammation, you know plays a very important role. But inflammation is you know important, right? It's a double-edged sword. You know the, the reason we all have this. Uh, very sophisticated and the redundant, you know, inflammation pathways is because it's important. But when you think of inflammation, you know, if it's a balance, you get the inflammation balance right, then it's protective. And that's why evolutionally, you know, we keep this. But as I said, you know, uh, more often than not, especially when you get older, unfortunately your inflammation system get out of order, over inflame, and that that's the root of many disease, you know. So the pathogenic aspect of inflammation, I think, it is the one that a lot of research and a lot of drug development is targeted on that. So you know, there are specific machinery. You know, there are many different inflammation pathways, and then there are the inflammasomes. You know, so these are the sort of protein multiplex. You know, basically, you know, have different inflammasomes in human and mouse and then doing the job of try to protect us, you know, against, you know, infection and other kind of uh, 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 biological uh, unbalance. So on the left is the human and mouse kind of uh, picture. On the right is the bat kind of uh, 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 picture. And I have to say, you know, all of these discoveries were made in our lab in the last six, seven years. So I have to say, it does not reflect the whole picture, you know, there must be other mechanisms. But already very impressive, I said, you know, inflammasome pathways are redundant and also they provide a, a cascade of regulation. So they are so important in your basic biology, they need to make sure, you know, everything is uh, function at the right, you know, so they have a ways to regulate. So first of all, you need to have a priming signal. So there's, a, and then you have a, a activation. So there's two steps that, and then in bats, the priming step is dampened, but it's still there. In terms of the activation, then you have the sensors. Okay, so you can sense the different ligands. You know, for example, the M2 family sends a double strand DNA as a danger signal, and for bats, that sensor is deleted. Among all the mammals so far, if you do comparative genomics, bats is the only one have the DNA sensor deleted. And then you have this NIP3 sensor is still there, but it's dampened, you know, and then you have other proteins that exist in bats, but don't, it does not exist in mouse. And then you have the caspase one, which is uh, kind of uh, uh, not active and the, the I1 beta is also uh, uh, less active. So there are six 
different mechanism, the six different steps we have identified in our group that to, to dampen it. So then you ask why, you know, why bats need to do that? And that's what I, the opening remark I made already because the bats flies, right? So that even DNA damage and the oxidative stress, you know, what bat has to face is very different from human and mouse. So that's why I think uh, it's the long term of evolution. So how dampen inflammation can explain, you know, bats as a, a good reservoir, basically. A good reservoir is something that you can control the virus replication without causing a disease. So that, you know, the pathogen is happy and the host is happy, and then they can have a long relationship. So this has been, you know, now out for two, uh, three years now. So the first thing we did is that using PBMCs from human and uh, bats, and then, you know, we use the uh, uh, different viruses, you know, including uh, MERS to infect this, you know. So, so this is uh, the data I'm showing is specifically for MERS coronavirus. And uh, so, as I said, you need uh, something to priming. So LPS is a good primer. And then you can activate with viral infection with other, you know, chemicals. So here we use LPS as a priming and the most coronavirus infection as a trigger for activation. And so we stand for the you know, spike protein, that's the indication of the virus uh, replicate successfully, and it's a confocal, and we use the uh, 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 standing for uh, the ASC formation. So the ASC1 protein will aggregate to a SPAC and a very uh, strong, tiny red dot. That means the inflammation is activated, and then you have a merge, right? So this is not human as we expected in you know, a viral infection and activation. And here you have the viral infection, but really no activation of the NIP3 mediated inflammation pathways. So this is, I just want to give you one example of this. And then, you know, if you go back to the slides, right, downstream, you know, so this is the NIP3, and then they will interact with the ASP and go to caspase and R1 beta and trigger the downstream sort of inflammation reaction. So then, you know, another PhD student, she, Jerry, uh, uh, did that and tried to look to see that in the absence of M2, whether the downstream, you know, components in uh, bats are still active. And then cut a long story short, we found a fascinating evolutionary kind of, you know, uh, passes. The end of the results is the same to dampen the inflammation pathways, but you look at the caspase one and versus the I1 beta. Remember the caspase one is just immediately downstream from the S1 signaling, and then you will go from a pro enzyme to active enzyme, and then they cleave I1 beta, and then I1 beta will be secreted to trigger the downstream inflammation uh, pathway. So we did this in three bat species, the large flying fox from Australia, the Eonyxus from in Singapore, and my mouth is the, the insectivorous bats in, in, in China. And really, really interesting, right? So, you know, you look at the uh, uh, caspase one activity, for example, you know, it goes that way. And you look at I1 cleavage efficiency if you go that way. So basically that you have the Australian bats, the I1 beta is fully functional but the caspase one is almost completely knocked out activity. And the Singapore bats in the middle and the Chinese bats for caspase one, but the cleavage is less efficient. So the end of results is if you get an infection, human will go a full blown inflammation, you know, a reaction and pathway, whereas in bats, you know, they are all dampened by, you know, using different mechanisms. So this, I think it is, you know, I'm not an evolution biologist, but I think it's just uh, such a beautiful illustration to say for bats, it's very important to keep the inflammation level down, but you can do that with very different ways for different bats. Okay, so for immunological studies, you know, mouse is the model and we, from time to time we get a, a criticism, right? mouse are not humans, you know, which everybody agrees, but everybody uses it. So, you know, so when we do bats, you know, bats are not humans either, but very pleasant surprise is that, you know, when we get enough kind of a genome and we try to do really a phylogeny based on immunophenotyping. So, you know, and we have another paper uh, kind of in rebuttal right now. So this initially was just bioinformatically. 
So you, you look at, you know, over maybe a thousand genes in the immune pathways. So you look at this human is here, the mouse and the rat, you know, the, the one we use the most is here. And then pig is still closer to human, but the bats overall is closer to human than mouse. So this is good news for us because we have found, you know, certain targets in bats, which is a highly conserved with human, you know, like the NIP3, we can exchange a caspase one, we can exchange it between bats and a uh, uh, human. So from there, you know, we can basically find new targets and hopefully translate. So now, you know, uh, a good to the, the, the last topic because I think this is still the, the hottest right now. Everybody is really thinking about COVID-19 and how can we get out, you know, whether, you know, uh, how important the variant, you know, will be in two months, three months uh, from now, you know. So really the discussion about whether we will ha have a uh, SARS-3 and how do you define that? You know, so uh, for those of you who know me, I'm actually a very conservative scientist. Usually I don't like to go out and, you know, uh, uh, do kind of predictions. But uh, when I uh, moved from Australia to Singapore and after the emergence of the MERS coronavirus in 2012, uh, a journalist, a science journalist from Straits Times, you know, uh, that's the kind of newspaper, uh, the, the key newspaper in, in Singapore. And they really, you know, forced me to make a prediction. So I made a mistake of agree. And I say, you know, if you want me to bet, I'm almost certain that in the next 10 years, a nuclear virus spread by bats will emerge, you know. You know, many scientists in the audience, you know, if you make a brave prediction like that, you know, uh, on one hand, you want to be right, you know, but in our profession, you know, it's pretty kind of sad, right? If you got your prediction right, means people have to suffer. So this was in 2013, and I say in the next 10 years, so six years later, 2019, we did have COVID-19, you know, so, but, you know, it's not a fluke, right? You know, people like Eddie and myself, we have been working this field for a long, long time. And we have been trying to convince, you know, the policymakers, the funding bodies to say, you know, we need to do better, you know. So this was a grant, you know, I got 2016, you know, equivalent to ARC in Australia, we call the NIF grant. So basically is to try to work out new strategies to do active surveillance and, uh, you know, try to combat the next, you know, SARS or most like emerging disease event. And in 2019, you know, uh, I wrote this review with Daniel Anderson, basically about virus impacts and a potential spillover. In the last part of the discussion, we say, you know, uh, that was this, uh, published in early 2019. And we say among the known unknowns, that coronavirus may be the more likely cause for the next basic spillover or pandemic. You know, so where we are now is, you know, so this is a family tree. I simplify this just to show you, you know, in the coronavirus family, we have four genera. And uh, unfortunately, they use the same alphabet in alpha, you know, uh, beta, delta, and gamma as the variants, basically. But now I think uh, uh, everybody knows that the beta coronavirus is the one we need to watch out because the emerging zoonotic uh, uh, coronavirus, you know, start from SARS-1 and then to MERS and then SARS-2 is all in this genus. And then if you go to the subgenus, now we call the SARS, you know, related beta coronavirus or cybeco viruses, then you have the SARS-1 and SARS-2. And then among the cybeco viruses, you can further divide it right now. I mean, there's the accumulation of sequence is, you know, very, very rapid. And uh, there are, I think, uh, two categories. One, I think we already know the virus can use the human AC2 receptor as an entry uh, uh, functional uh, uh, entry receptor. So these are the more dangerous ones, SARS-1, SARS-2, and there are many others that are ready to jump, basically. You know, then you have the other category with what we call the, the uh, AC2 non-binder viruses. Their risk in terms of their spillover into human and cause disease potential, really nobody knows. And it's very hard to study because uh, this virus, we have not been able to isolate live virus from bats because they don't use SE2 and we don't know what function receptor they use. And unfortunately, in the current political 
environment, you know, the only remaining two we have is the reverse genetics, right? So we can from sequence to make a virus and try to rescue the study. And uh, in every nation right now, I think that these kind of studies are, you know, not impossible, but very difficult to get approval and the scientists try to avoid as much as possible, you know. But if you want to, you know, I don't want to predict again, but if you want to do a risk assessment, you know, say what SARS-3 will most be uh, uh, like, then I think uh, personally, you know, I, I think uh, it's most likely be another sub virus, basically in that kind of cluster, you know, AD, you know, collab with uh, scientists around the world has published many of them. And uh, I think, uh, you know, from unpublished data, I think uh, they are close to 150 individual cyber viruses existing in bats, you know, so that's just uh, in our region in Asia mainly, you know. So, you know, unfortunately where I am, you know, Southeast Asia is a hot spot. And <clears throat> these are the countries that the surveillance is ramping up, but are certainly not as uh, intensive as within the border of China, you know. So neutral antibody and immune evasion. So I have to say, you know, for somebody who have been working on backbone coronavirus for almost 20 years before the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, I'm still learning the lesson the hard way. You know, first of all, I thought SARS-CoV-2 be like SARS-CoV-1 cannot be that transmissible and I was proven wrong. And secondly, we thought, you know, the neutral antibodies and the vaccines we were having, you know, this time last year would be good enough, but I think uh, very rapidly, very quickly, now the real world data proven basically that we're far from, you know, ready to even to contain the current pandemic because the immune evasion. So I borrow this uh, <clears throat> prof Professor Shen Crotty on this, you know, the different layers of uh, immune defenses, you know. I mean, people are always asking about which is more important, T cell or the B cell, the neutral antibody. I said that you cannot really compare that way. You know, both are important, but play a slightly different, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, roles. But even Sean, you know, uh, Shane, you know, is a, is a T cell immunologist, you know, and then he put, neutral antibody is really in the front line. So neutral antibody certainly plays a role, you know, more important role in terms of the prevent infection transmission, but also play a role later on, you know, in terms of disease, you know, uh, severity and things like that. And then, you know, this is from where you are in Sydney, you know, so a mouse group, you know, is really kind of leading the world into this modeling mathematic, try to correlate really to say neutral antibodies is a, uh, good predictor of protection. So this is in the context of vaccines, right? So that paper, I don't know how many times people have cited this, you know, so if you use the convalescent, uh, so people infected with uh, the first wave of COVID-19 and the recover, you use that antibody and you define that at neutral antibody level as one. And then at a protection around maybe, you know, 70, uh, oh, sorry, 85, 90 something percent. And then the different vaccines, the mRNA vaccine, the protein subunit vaccine, all the way to the uh, inactive virus vaccine, as you can see, it's like a four-fold up or four-fold down compared with the, you know, the original. And this correlate very well with the uh, uh, protective if efficacy. But how do you measure neutral antibodies, right? For the virologists in the audience, you know, in those days, you know, we only know one way to measure neutralizing antibody, and that's the gold standard. That's a, a live virus neutralization test, right? So you mix your antibody with the live virus. If you have neutral antibodies, then hopefully you block that. If you don't, the virus still goes in and cause the uh, uh, cytopathic effect, you know. It's a gold standard because it's uh, the best in specificity and you measure the functionality, really. But there's a lot of disadvantages, you know, first for the virus like SARS-1, SARS-2, you know, BSS-3, very tedious in the throat, highly skilled and the uh, stuff required, very expensive. And you could not really do large numbers in the multiplex. You ha have to do one virus at a time. And the, like the biosafety rules, like in Singapore, we just could not do two live virus together in the same room, you know? So that is alone, will prevent you to do comparative neutralization test of the, all the variants, for example. 
So very early on, you know, uh, I came back from Wuhan in January and then February and I worked with my team. We invented something called a, a surrogate virus neutralization test. So there's two forms of surrogate right now in being used in practice. One is what we call the pseudo virus. So it's, cell, it's still a live virus, just, you know, using a backbone of HIV or BSV, and you put a spike protein onto the uh, pseudo type of virus surface. So that only saw one issue, biosafety. So you can do from BSS3 to BSS2, but you don't really solve all the other issues. You still have a live virus and you still have the you know, tedious and, and also you cannot do multiplex. So what we did is to invent this surrogate, we went one step further because we basically did a biochemical surrogate, okay? So instead of using a live virus or pseudovirus, we use the proteins. So we cloned the receptor, the AC2, and express the soluble protein purifier and just put on the ELISA plate. And uh, <clears throat> we cloned the most important domain, the receptor binding domain, direct conjugated with the host registry peroxidase. So now we have a biochemical acid to mimic this, to mix your antibody with the IBD conjugate before you put on the plate to the AC2. If you can block that binding, then you have neutral antibody. So the readout is a uh, 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 enzymatic uh, Chirometric uh, uh, reading, and you can do that within our and any lab, BSC2 research or clinic lab. And then, if you claim the surrogate, you know, is performing as good, and you have to demonstrate that. So, this is the live virus uh, uh, plug reduction neutralization assay, and that's the commercial kit C pass the surrogate. And as you can see, you know, the, the uh, correlation is uh, R square is 0 0.95, and that was commercialized, you know, so we have a commercial kit. So all well, you know, we move very fast and uh, apply successfully, then the variant came. Immediately, you know, I mean, those are the days, you know, you have the alpha, beta, right, you know, gamma, you know, so, so we got a hit. The neutral antibody basically against the origin virus, you know, uh, does not reflect that the real neutralization capability against this variant. So what we did is to modify this platform in three ways. First is we reversing the uh, liquid and solid phase configuration. Remember in the previous one, the AC2 receptor that we put on the ELISA plate. So the receptor is on the ELISA plate and the IBD is liquid. So we cannot multiply that. So we now change this, use the Luminex magnetic beads. We put the IBDs. So, so each variant IBD will have one bead. But now the AC2 is in the liquid phase and it's already direct conjugate with the fluorescent uh, uh, dye P, uh, uh, PE. So now we can do multiplex and here we show three and we are up to 23 now. So we do a 23 plex neutralization assay against 23 different sub virus, including all the variants and also bat pangolin you know, virus and also the human SARS-1 viruses. And to even make it more kind of uniform is that we biotinylated the IBD so the, the protein now all stand up. If you do a chemical conjugation onto the bees, then the IBD can you know, be conjugated onto the bees in many different configurations. So now with a biotin and we buy everything bees. So then, uh, you know, so now what we have is basically equal molar of the IBD on uh, different bees. And we have the same receptor the only difference comes in now is the antibody. So that you basically create an in-tube competition and you get a much more accurate measurement and also much more specific because the homologous neutral antibody, for example, if you have a BA1, you know, if you go to the Omicron, we can differentiate BA1 antibody from BA2, BA4, BA5. So that kind of resolution that use the traditional virus neutralization is very hard to get. So Omicron, you know, that's really the cause of all the headache, you know, the, depends on which country you are, the third wave, the fourth wave, and so on, right? So the first thing is that, uh, you know, try to really understand why Omicron is uh, such a potent, you know, virus in terms of uh, evade the uh, antibody media immune uh, uh, protection. And most people say, oh, it's easy because they have more mutations, you know? So if you zoom into the most important receptor binding domain, you know, these are the number of mutations. Alpha has one, Delta two, uh, Beta three, and Omicron 15. So if you stop there and you say, okay, yes, that explains, you know, the mutations, the more mutations, you have more uh, uh, reduction of neutralization against the original uh, uh, ancestral virus. 
But for our lab, you know, we have been focused on the subacle. Every AC2 binding virus, we have a surrogate virus neutralization. So I just give you two examples of this RADG13, which is a backbone virus, has 22 mutations in the same region. And the GXP5R is a sequence from pangolin. So these are all sequences, not live viruses, of course. And then have 30. So double the mutation in the Omicron variant, okay? So, but when you go to now, so these are the really kind of a number of mutations on top, right? In comparison with SARS-1, and you can go all the way, you know, so in comparison with SARS-2, the ancestral virus, and then SARS-1, you know, has the most mutations, okay? And, uh, but if you look at it here, just, uh, you know, we have many, many different zero panels. So this is just a medium, you know, the, of the different zero panels. And uh, so let's come to Omicron first. So this Omicron BA1 and this Omicron BA2, remember it's around 15 MLS mutations in the RBD region. Reg13 has 22 and the pangolin virus has 30, double the mutation. And yet in terms of uh, neutralization reduction from the parental virus, you know, these two virus is less reduced than that. Now you look at the, you know, uh, uh, the other mutations like the beta and the mu, you know, these are the variants from human. And then we have the virus from bats and the, another pangolin virus, you know, so these are, have, you know, so what we have the banner virus here, you know, we have uh, 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 eight mutations, the pangolin, we have seven, whereas the beta, we have the three, right? So you double the number of mutations in RBD, yet the neutralization escaping, the beta is more potent, okay? so. What we did then is to look at really plot the number of mutations in the IBD area and versus the title of neutralization or the job of the, you know, from the original parental viruses here, and you see a job. Yes, when you accumulate mutation in the receptor binding domain, you will have a job of neutralization, but the slope is different. So this is the animal virus, you know, from bats, pangolins, and all the way you can see. If you have a natural evolution in a reservoir species with a strong uh, immune selection, you have that curve. And then for the uh, uh, variance of concern, you have that curve, you know. So this is the kind of, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, 20 different panels against 30 different viruses. So these are the convalescent. So not vaccinated. And then you recover from, you know, beta, delta, SARS. And these are vaccinated, uh, just two doses. These are boosted and then heterologous boosted. And these are hybrid, you know, so you have the vaccinated with Omicron Delta breakthrough, or you had a COVID-19 and a SARS and followed by vaccination. So I just want to really focus on the last panel. You know, this is the panel, you know, we published a, a, a year ago to say, if you had a recovered from SARS and get two doses of Pfizer vaccine, you have broad neutral antibody against everything when we, published. So beta is protected, uh, pangolin virus is protected, and RADG13 is protected. Even SARS-1, of course, is protected. They recover from SARS. But look at that, Omicron BA1 and BA2. I mean, they still have some neutralization, but huge reduction. So Omicron definitely evolved <laughs> under immune selection. It's not a natural evolution. You know, natural evolution of uh, sars cov virus does not behave like that, you know. So you know, again, again, you know, uh, we, we try to go a little bit further, try to study this antigenic cartography, right? So then, then we found that really, you know, if you use the classic virology, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we really, you know, uh, 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 classify virus by their uh, neutralizing antibody serial groupings, right? You know, especially for flavy, you know, polio and adenoviruses, many, many different serotypes. So now, you know, genetically, all these viruses belong to one species, SARS-related coronavirus, right? And then we have two prototypes we call the original SARS-CoV, and now we call SARS-CoV-1 and the SARS-CoV-2. Yes, serologically, they are in two distinct groups. But you look at Omicron. Omicron is almost as far away from here to here versus here to here, you know, and here to here. So. So that's what we are started thinking of this, you know, basically, and this is only BA1, BA2, and we have evidence that B1, 
BA4, BA5 itself is very different from BA1, you know. So, you know, two weeks ago, I was uh, uh, asked to get an interview with a uh, uh, Gretchen from Science, and uh, we talked about for 90 minutes, but I, I mean, she only picked up two things, and also, you know, her, her editor does not allow to go too much detail. So what I was referring to is our discovery of this. Uh, if you look at the, the uh, antigenic cartography, we can have three different serotypes. So basically, COVID-19, you know, you can have serotype one, two, three, and then, you know, her boss basically said that's too complicated, and say let's just call it SARS three. So, so you know, this is a kind of a, a, a something in the in the science <clears throat> came out last week, and in China they caused a lot of uh, kind of discussion, and. The second part, you know, I talked a lot of topics, but she picked up two things that are thinking that it's worthwhile. The second is really how can we prevent, you know, get ready for SARS-3. And then I think uh, more and more we learned the lesson to get the, the, you know, dream vaccine is difficult, but to get this uh, cross neutralized antibody, especially now we can engineer the antibody to have a half-life to good all the way to six months. That if you have a cocktail and the shelf, you're ready on the shelf stocked, Next time you have a, you know, another Sabeco virus, I think we have more chance to develop a reagent, you know, pan Sabeco ready to use than try to develop a vaccine, you know. So just to, you know, to, to finish up is that uh, uh, spear over versus spear back, you know, COVID-19 give us a new really kind of uh, challenge is that the forward, the reverse zoonotic transmission, right? Traditionally, we think of wildlife is reservoir and amplifying host. You know, but now for COVID-19, we know that human gave the mink, mink mutate back to human. And initially we were worried about bats and uh, other wildlife in uh, North America because they don't have runoff bats, but they do have bats with ACE2 that can take in SARS-CoV-2. So if that happens, you know, they become a new reservoir, you know, the unnatural reservoir, and then they come back, you know, SARS-3, SARS-4. So we will focus on bats, but then the white-tailed deer story that you guys all know, you know, so now there are many, you know, uh, uh, studies and they use serology. And I was very pleased they use my CPAS because my CPAS is species independent. We develop for human and animal use. So use the uh, CPAS, very specific initialization, they detect uh, up to 80% in certain population of the deer that is positive for SARS-CoV-2, uh, multiple lineages and uh, asymptomatic infection, you know. So the current vaccines are basically not good enough and uh, in terms of SARS-3, you know. So more than a year ago, John Combs published this fantastic, you know, perspective that we need a dream vaccine, basically need a broad spectrum. So it says, you know, dream comes in different generations, just like our, uh, mobile phones, and you know, we have 1G to 5G, you know, vaccine, the, we, the, all the vaccine we receive the first generation, right, is the ancestral virus. The second generation vaccine people are working on a VOC specific, but none of them has gone to really uh, 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 licensed vaccine, you know, the Chinese are testing their inactivated uh, uh, Omicron vaccine and good luck to them, I don't think that will be effective. And then, so what we are working on is the third generation vaccine to target all the cervical viruses. And there are scientists more ambitious to, than me try to target the beta or target the whole, you know, uh, coronaviruses, you know. So I'm not going to go there. So, so the, the, you know, the, the data is published. As I said, you know, we made a discovery last year this time that if you suffered from SARS and the, uh, recovered, when we give you uh, 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 Pfizer, mRNA vaccine, you get much better pan sarbeco neutralizing antibodies, and not only get a boost to SARS-2, but also SARS-1 and all the uh, virus in between. And as I have shown in the data, you know, they get a discount with Omicron. Other than Omicron, we can neutralize every virus, including the animal virus in bats and pangolins. So I think what happened is that this cross clay, you know, uh, 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 boosting because uh, immune system, you know, whether you're bad or humans, that we our immune system is pretty smart. They target immunodominant epitopes and in, induce the neutral antibody. Unfortunately for, for you know, coronavirus, these immunodominant virus are very strand or variant specific. So that, that in order to get a cross neutralization, you have to boost with a very distant related virus. So by accident, you know, we find that COVID-19 uh, vaccine on SARS survivors 
achieve that and we got this. So even that concept, and then, then we patent the concept and then we design a vaccine we call a consensus spy protein, not based on the variants. Instead, we go all the way to the SARS-1 clade. So the human SARS-1 plus 18, uh, 12 bat viruses. And we produce this consensus sequence and we produce a trimeric spy protein in-house and we immunize mice with approved human vaccines. You know? So this is something we are lucky in Singapore because our government negotiated with the supply, allow these vaccines to be used in research with in Australia, you, know, you guys cannot use that. So we primed the, the mice with you know, uh, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, uh, uh, Sinovac, and then we challenge, not challenge, we boosted with the vaccine that we produced and uh, all of them really get beautiful pan sub virus. And so we're working with farmers try to see if we can use that as a booster vaccine, which will be hopefully variant agnostic and even sub virus agnostic. So just to finish up, you know, for pandemic preparedness, you know, I mean, you can do pre spill over surveillance. And we were discussing that before you guys came on and early warning or countermeasures, you know, and I was fortunate enough that Singapore government was very rapid, you know, so they invested $130 million uh, early last year. And uh, I was uh, very privileged to be asked to, to be the uh, inaugural executive director. So we're director of national pandemics prepare program. And uh, so we want to do better in data analytics, real time, environmental transmission, diagnostic vaccine therapies, and the uh, region networks. And underpinning that we have a, a infrastructure for database and also biobanking. So looking forward, you know, unfortunately I could not come in person, but next time, when I'm in uh, Sydney, certainly we can discuss, you know, with our collaboration with you guys. And thank for my team, everybody. This is the happy Christmas party, uh, December 2019. You know, without realizing when we were having parties, you know, the severe pneumonia in Wuhan already started, and the three key players, you know, uh, 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 invented the the, the uh, uh, CPAS, and the, that's the Chiwa Wani is doing the vaccine. And uh, Zhu Feng is the bioinformatician who designed this consensus. And I have to thank these uh, cute guys and uh, lots of uh, you know, uh, collaborators. Last but not least, the, the, we have a One Health Congress uh, uh, 7 to 11th November and uh, hope many in the audience can come. Thank you. <laughs>